Thank you for joining with us this morning on Good Friday, a day of great evil and great joy. Uh, what a strange day, what a wonderful day it is. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to wait five minutes for people who um, straggle in, um, but we um, are here to remember what God has done for us. So as we do that, we begin this morning with uh, a couple of songs which remind us of God's love, His grace. Uh, so my name's Michael and I'd like to welcome you this morning and we begin with Amazing Love and the Old Rugged Cross. Let's, uh, when the band's ready, we'll stand and sing. Good morning, everybody. How are you, how are you going?
Please be seated. also created hands. God gave us hands. Hands to create. Hands to love. Hands to help. Hands to give. Hands to protect. But our hands we have misused. Hands made to create now destroy. Hands made to love now hate. Hands made to help, now reject. Hands made to give, now grab. Hands made to protect, now let down. But God reached out his loving hands to a destructive world. He picked up his fallen creation and put his hands around them. But they made him a captive and nailed him to a cross. And they mocked him. But Jesus didn't remain on the cross. He rose and lives and now he walks through our world, stretching out his loving hands to all who will come to him. What will you do? Will you come to him and put your hand in his? Or will you reject him? The choice is yours. Thank you to our young adults discipleship group called Daggy for that drama. Uh, we've been practicing that for nearly a month. Um, now we're going to have William come to the front and give us a Bible reading. Thank you, William. Turn it on. Oh, no, it's on. Okay. <laughs> Our first reading today is from Matthew 27, verses 45 to 66. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land about three. In the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. 
immediately one of them ran to and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and offered him to a drink. But the rest said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were, the, were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and they came out of the tombs after his resurrection uh, I'll try that again and they came out of his tombs out of the tombs after his resurrection yes yeah, that's what it says entered the holy city and appeared to many when of the uh, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened they were terrified and said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and looked after him were there, <coughs> watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea came to Joseph the named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. He uh, approached a pi Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his tomb, a new tomb, which he had dug into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary <clears throat> were seated there, facing the tomb. The next day which followed, the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, So we remembered that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I will rise again. So give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come, steal him, and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last, de and the last deception will be worse than the first. Take guards, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. They went and secured the tomb by setting a seal on the stone and placing guards. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you very much for doing that reading, William. Uh, let's pray now as we come to think about um, that. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day of remembrance. We thank you for Good Friday that evil day that has been so good for the whole world and we ask Lord God that your spirit would be with us this morning that we would hear and understand and believe in Jesus name Amen Jesus cries out my God my God why have you abandoned me um, it's fairly natural isn't it? it's fairly normal for all of us to call out why when suffering comes uh, when you experience that trial, that difficulty, that pain that is so great that it's pushing you to um, your, your ability to cope or even beyond your ability to cope, don't we all go, why is this happening to me? Why um, are you doing this? Um, why is God so far away from me? So Jesus is experiencing that here. I think this is genuine emotion that Jesus is calling out. Um, a sense of abandonment too. Um, this is perhaps the first time in his uh, entire being that the son feels distant from the father. So there's a real genuine sense 
of abandonment here. It's not just, oh, why is this bad thing happening? It's also, why is God so far away? I think it's uh, probably a little bit difficult for us to um, capture how Jesus would have felt at that moment. Um, the closest I can think is uh, in, in 1980, 1998, there was a couple on their honeymoon on the Great Barrier Reef. You remember this story? They're diving. Um, so there's a group of, I don't know how many, 20 or 40 people go down to the bottom, have a look around. Isn't it beautiful? They came back up and the boat was gone. They're something like 20 kilometers from the shore, from the mainland, and they're on their own. And so they must have just floated on the surface wondering, where are they? Why did they leave us? Is no one going to come and help us? We're going to die here. How long did they float there crying together, saying this is our honeymoon, this is the start of our life together and it's the end? They were utterly abandoned by the people who should have cared for them. Jesus cries out in a, an agony of heart, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I think it's genuine emotion. But I think it's more than that. I believe it's also an explanation of what's happening. Because there's big questions about what's going on in the. You, you saw the Bible reading, you heard William read it to us. There's some really strange things happening in there and we've got to actually work out for ourselves what is going on. Why is Jesus dying? Why is this happening to him? But what does it all mean as well? You see, we can come to different conclusions. I don't know if you noticed, but the centurion, um, after watching all that, he said, surely this man was the son of God. But the Pharisees went to um, Pilate and said, that deceiver said all sorts of things. There'll be another deception if we're not careful. So even in the story itself, we see people who have different explanations. Oh, he's a liar and he's made up all these stories. Oh, he must be the son of God. Well, we've got to work it out for ourselves and the disciples are in the position of trying to work out what was really going on there. And Jesus is telling us the answer to that question. What's really going on here? Because Jesus is expressing his situation, his emotion, but he's also quoting a psalm. Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It's a psalm that David wrote. And it perhaps initially expressed David's feeling when God had uh, seemed to delay to come and help to him. Uh, David says, I, I lie on my bed at night and can't sleep. I cry all day and you don't answer me. So David was feeling like God was far away. But the psalm does more than that. It, it starts to talk about how he, his his body is, um, his heart is melting like wax within him, within him. how his, his bones are all disjointed. It talks about how his hands and feet are pierced. It talks about how he's surrounded by people who mock him. It talks about how his clothes are divided up and that they um, cast lots over his clothing. And the more you read Psalm, 20, 20, uh, Psalm 22, the more you see that, that can't be talking about anything else other than Jesus' crucifixion. There's just so many things that, that come to fit in place so that in the end you conclude David, by the Holy Spirit, was given a prophecy about what would happen to Jesus. And yet, in the middle of Psalm 22, this psalm that starts by saying, God, you seem so far away. In the middle of the psalm, David says, but you heard me. And then the rest of the psalm talks about how David will praise God's name, about how um, God's people will praise his name, and about future generations will hear about what God has done, and they will worship God. And it becomes very clear that that line in the middle of the psalm, you heard me, is a change, a turning place, where David goes from feeling like God doesn't hear us to God is right with us and doing amazing things to rescue us. And that's the answer to what's happening to Jesus. That's the answer to why Jesus, someone who had never been far from God, who unlike us, like we let down God all the time, we're half-hearted about our faith, 
We're sometimes interested in talking to God about our problems. Sometimes we're not. We turn to God in praise and thanks sometimes and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we want to give him the honor and glory that's due to him and sometimes we don't. Yet Jesus always honored the Father. And what we find out happens is that he took our place. Because we ignore God, we're not in good fellowship with him and he sometimes feels far away. And yet on that day, Jesus takes our place and God abandons him so that we could become his friends. Did you notice the next thing that happened uh, in that Bible reading? We hear that Jesus calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he cries out again, breathes his last. And what was the next thing that happened? It said two things. The temple um, curtain was torn in two and people came out of their graves. Now, those are both two kind of... uh, supernatural things they're things that couldn't have just happened but they happened then for a reason the the temple was the place where people worshiped God and they came to worship God but they weren't allowed to get too close to God because he is holy and we are not and there was a curtain to keep you out of where God was and that's the curtain that's ripped from top to bottom that tells us that the distance between us and God is gone the separation between us and God is gone. When Jesus died, we were able to come into God's presence. The people coming out of the tombs is symbolic because it's not everybody yet. It's just a few people. But it's kind of a reminder, a symbol, a, a promise, I guess, that God has defeated death. And so the two things that are our biggest problems in this world, we're far away from God and and death comes to us all, they are solved in the cross because they both come from sin, our selfishness, our wickedness. When we put ourselves first and hurt others, like we saw in that drama, that we all do, that's called sin. And it means we can't be God's friends and it means we go to the grave. But on that day, both stopped. We can be God's friends and we don't have to stay in the grave. Sin is dealt with because all our sin was put on Jesus. He takes away our sin. And he's telling us by quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's telling us that that psalm is all about him and that he has found a way for God to save us. Um. In, uh, in 2016, someone was um, scrounging at the Tenerfield tip. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of useful things you can find at the tip. I've got a coffee table that was made from timber I found at the area park tip. Um, so you can find useful things there. A person was just having a scratch around at Tenerfield tip in 2016 and they found a hessian sack with some mouldy old wet papers... Um, a penny with a hole in it on a string that had been bent by a bullet and had some initials on it. They found a British flag that dated from the Boer War, which is a war that England and uh, kind of Dutch settlers were having in South Africa. And they found some inscriptions on the flag and some of the letters and they were, ended up being donated to the museum in Tenterfield And there's fairly strong evidence that these relics are connected to Breaker Morant. Have you heard of Breaker Morant? There was a movie, I think, in... uh, Was it 1980, I think? Something like that. Um, Breaker Morant was an Australian soldier who served in the British Empire forces in South Africa um, during the Second Boer War. Um, Boer is just uh, Afrikaners for farmer, and so it was a war when the English... And the Dutch settlers are fighting over who's going to have South Africa, the English or the Dutch. It was probably our first war where guerrilla warfare tactics started to play a big, big role. So it kind of got nasty. And uh, Breaker Morant, at the end of the war, was charged with war crimes, uh, killing civilians, murdering prisoners of war. His defence was, I was ordered to do that. My superiors told me 
to do that because of the nature of the war. They were doing that, we were doing that. It was a different kind of war. That was, that was his defence. He was found guilty and shot by firing squad and, it, and uh, it's believed that he said uh, to the soldiers just before he was killed, his last words were, shoot straight, don't make a mess of it. But Australians have wondered since whether there was more going on. If he was given those orders, why didn't the superior officers get in trouble as well? Or why was he held accountable for things that were the policy of the empire at that time? And some people argue that political deals were being done because Germany's power was on the rise and people wanted peace. And what's really interesting is on the flag that was found at the tip was an inscription that said, utter scapegoats of the empire. That was written in the handwriting, they've matched that handwriting, they, they say, to Major Thomas, who was the lawyer who defended, the, the army lawyer who defended um, Breaker Moran in his trial. The penny, which was on a string around someone's neck, had a bullet impression on the bottom of it, and it had Breaker Morant's initials on it. And they're suggesting that was around his neck when he was shot and that all this stuff was gathered up and brought back to Australia and somehow ended up on the tip. If that's all true, the officer who defended him is, has said, these guys were scapegoats. They were executed so that the British could look good and make peace with the German army, with the Dutch army and have like peace in that part of the world and they were prepared to sacrifice these soldiers in order to get that peace at a political level scapegoat is a terrible thing isn't it when you get scapegoated so that someone else can get what they want so they can have peace but scapegoat is actually a positive word the word scapegoat was invented by a man named William Tyndale who was translating the Bible into English. So he was translating the Old Testament from Hebrew. And he was in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, translating the Day of Atonement, uh, which um, is in Hebrew, they call it Yom Kippur. On the Day of Atonement, they used to get two goats and they'd cast lots to see what they did with those two goats. So one of the goats was going to do this, one was going to do that, and they just kind of if you like, flip a coin to see which one did what. One of them got sacrificed and used as an offering to cleanse the temple and to make up for the sins of the priests. But the other one, the priest would put his hand on the goat's head and confess the sins of the people and then get someone to take it way outside the camp and let it go. And William Tyndale called it, when he was trying to find a word in English and couldn't find one, he called it the escape goat. And so in the Day of Atonement for God's people, which they still practice today more or less, God provided a way for the people's sins to be taken away from them. And it was on what's called the scapegoat. So Breaker Morant might have been a scapegoat who was unwillingly killed that the empire might have peace. But what Jesus is telling us when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he points our attention to Psalm 22 and says, all those things are talking about me. And when it, the Psalm finishes by saying, generations are going to talk about what God has done for us. Jesus is saying that he's willingly a scapegoat. He is the sacrifice that will pay for our sin. He is taking our sins on him and he will take it far away from us. So any abandonment we feel, those times when you do feel like, is God here? Why am I going through this? I feel so alone. I can't cope with this suffering. Why do I have to do this? Where is God and what is he doing? We don't have to ask those questions anymore because we can know the answers. The Father sent the Son to die on a cross so that God could always be with us and we could always turn to him 
he became our scapegoat and our saviour. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we don't ever have to cry that out again. We know God is on our side because Jesus died on a cross to show that to us and to bring us back to God. Let me pray. Father, help us to understand how great your love is and how far away you have taken our sin from us and how you have set us free to love you and serve you and how deeply you care for us and are involved in our lives. Let us know that, let us feel that, let us live that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today is a day of uh, great joy, great sadness mixed. And the difference between that is um, repentance and faith. Whether it's a day of just great evil or a day of great rejoicing is, depends on our response to it. And so one of the things we're going to do now is give ourselves an opportunity to respond to what God has done. And what the Bible calls us to do is to turn to God in repentance and faith. And repentance is one of those old-fashioned words, isn't it? But what it really means is turning around or turning away. And so we're going to um, do that in a, a kind of an enacted way this morning. Uh, you can see um, our artwork at the front. Um, but at the um, back of the church, um, just, yeah, just behind Sophie, at the end of the pew in there, is a, a small plate with a collection of nails um, when I was at uh, university, I had a poster in my room on the wall that said, it was not the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his faithfulness to the Father, and it was our sin that kept him there. It was not the Jews who crucified Jesus. It was not the Romans who crucified Jesus. It was my sin that took him to the cross. It was our sin. And so we're going to think about that this morning. Uh, what I'll ask you to do is we're going to have um, some time of quiet reflection. If you would like to, feel free to pray a prayer of repentance um, and to turn to God and to say sorry for what you have done, for how you've failed, and then ask him to forgive you. And after we finish this, we will be reading some Bible readings that remind us how much God has forgiven us and that that forgiveness is there. But what you might also like to do is to leave your seat and go down one of the outside aisles, come around and grab a nail. There's all sorts of nails there, some shiny ones that are actually quite respectable and people won't give you any grief about. We have sins like that, don't we? Nice, bright sins that everybody thinks are okay. There's some big ones. There's some little ones. There's some old nails that have been around for quite a long time. There's all sorts of nails there. You might like to grab a nail and pause and reflect on why Christ went to the cross and you might like to give that sin to God and ask him to forgive you. So come down the front and place the nail on the cross and leave it there and know as you go back to your seat that if you've confessed your sin you can leave it with God that his death takes it away and it is gone. There'll be some music playing in the background, um, but it's a time of reflection. So what I'll ask you to do is just, if whatever you want, if you're comfortable, go down one of the side aisles, grab a nail, and then come after some reflection and prayer, give your sin to Christ, and know that you are forgiven. Let's do that now.
not sure if I could do that if I didn't know that God was going to forgive me because of what Christ has already done. I know it certainly makes it easier to look into the darkness of your own soul honestly when you know that there's a God who loves and forgives you. And so what we want to do now is reassure this congregation with some words from Scripture, God's words, that remind us of how God loves us. So I'm going to ask Rob and Michelle to come and help me to do some Bible readings for you. Uh, Rob will read um, from Isaiah 53. Then I'm going to read Psalm 22, parts of Psalm 22 with you. Um, the words will come up on the screen and I'll read the normal print and I'll encourage you to read together the bold print and we'll read that psalm together and then Michelle will finish with a part of Romans 8. Thank you Rob. Just reading from Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Psalm 22. Next one. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are... My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. But you are holy. Our ancestors trusted in you. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. My strength is dried up like baked clay. For dogs have surrounded me. I can count all my bones. They divided my garments among themselves. Rescue my life from the sword. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild ox. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. Their descendants will serve him. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. And from Romans, Michelle. Romans 8, verses 35 to 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written... Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Michelle. Jesus has died for us um, to bring us back to God. There is nothing else that can separate us from God's love. I'm going to ask the musicians to come to the front and we're going to sing to remind ourselves of that truth. Um, another couple of beautiful songs that Warren's chosen for us. Um, and uh, we'll sing and then uh, that'll be the, the finish of our remembrance service today. While they're getting ready, let me just do the announcements now and then we'll just finish with the two songs. Um, just want to let you know a few things happening this weekend. Um, immediately after this service, you're more than welcome to come with us out to Jurai, to Mitch and Emma's place, to share hot cross buns with us. Everybody's invited to be part of that. Um, if you don't know where that is, there's a little green slip of paper on the bench in the foyer. Just grab one of those. It's got the address and instructions on it so you'll be able to find your way there. Um, and then just the other thing, two other things that are happening this Sunday... Um, there's a dawn service you can go to at 6am, which is um, uh, always quite a, a moving service. And we have our service here at 9am, and it's a breakfast celebration. We're rejoicing that Christ is alive and we are alive in him. So uh, we meet together for breakfast at 9 and have our, our resurrection celebration service together here at 9. There's invitations there in the foyer. Um, for you to give to friends, invite other people to come along if you'd like to. Um, and there's invitations for you to the dawn service as well. They're on, all this is on the bench in the foyer. Um, we'd love to see you at uh, any of those events to remember what God has done for us. Um, remembering what God has done for us? Let's sing it now. Please stand and we'll sing. Thanks, Warren and the band. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the next song might be not so familiar to some, but it's called By His Wounds. And and the, the artwork here in front of us and the, the Bible reading that Rob read is uh, this song is taken from that passage. So if you don't know the words, that's okay, but uh, let's, let's go with it anyway. <coughs>
Society for the Power of the Cross. So uh, yeah, let's join together and sing this, this lovely song. <laughs> 